we are all at home in a great tradition. Each a leaf of one rooted and branching tree. May our worship this morning give blossom to our beautiful life. It's from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 to 32. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Your hands are me. On May 19th, 1841, Theodore Parker gave our tradition a spiritual audit. His fee of service was negligible, but his findings proved costly. Mounting the pulpit of Hawes Place Church in South Boston, this young Harvard-trained minister had the audacity to take critical stock of the tradition to which he had dedicated his life. Though I may not share Parker's soaring intellect and insight, I am unfortunately plagued with his same audacity. <laughs> <laughs> and so this morning, I have resolved to take up Parker's challenge anew. In framing his evaluation, Parker distinguished between the transient on the one hand and the permanent on the other. The one is the thought, the folly, the uncertain wisdom, the theological notions, the impiety of man, Parker suggested, whereas the other bespeaks the eternal truth of God. You might say that Parker took it upon himself to separate the religious wheat from the chaff. What will endure of this faith, he asked, and what will pass away, destined to collective amnesia or condemned as popular superstition? Now, Parker's findings offer little consolation to the faint of heart. He dismissed nearly all of Christian tradition and theology as partial, and hence as provisional. Yet, yet, buried within this looming mountain of accretion, Parker discovered the hidden jewel of absolute religion. What he believed was Jesus of Nazareth's great man, love of God and love of neighbor. That was all. And yet to Parker, that was everything. At the time, as you might imagine, Parker's sermon unleashed a cresting wave of criticism, directed less, though, at what Parker professed to know, and more at how Parker professed to know it. You see, most Unitarians of that age invested scripture with, with ultimate authority. But Parker, by contrast, relied on the individual human experience, on what each person reasons and intuits on her own, or on what he described as the oracle that God places in the breast. Religion is true, Parker argued, because religion, above all, is person. In hindsight, with 2020 vision, Parker got it wrong. Course. Unitarian Universalism no longer flat flies the flag of Jesus' great commandment, at least not explicitly or without significant contention. What Parker planted as absolute religion has since weathered in the heat of time. And yet Parker, inadvertently perhaps, also got it right. His approach to religious knowing endures. 
What carries over from Parker's time is his <coughs> insistence on the individual search for truth over and against the collective wisdom of tradition. His insistence that religion is at its core a deeply personal act, one that precedes all cultural, societal, and institutional forms. The Unitarian Universalism of present-day America is defined not by Parker's truth, but by Parker's technique. Our method has become our message. During his tenure as president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Reverend Bill Sinkford introduced the idea of an elevator speech. How would you describe Unitarian Universalism to someone in 45 seconds as you're descending from the sixth floor down to the lobby? I imagine that many of us in the sanctuary this morning have faced this very challenge, if not in an elevator, perhaps at a social gathering or a dinner, or when you're sitting around the table with relatives. How do you respond? If you're anything like me with some trepidation, the fact that these encounters generate so much panic and angst testifies to our method of individualism, that each Unitarian Universalist is responsible for defining the tradition on his or her own. Truly, the most honest elevator speech would explain how each member has a different elevator speech. Our method has become our message. And I'm not so sure that's a good thing. Now before I go any further, I want to be clear. It's not our method per se that concerns me. On the contrary, I champion our method because I see it save lives. But I am weary of our method as our message. And here's why. Firstly, our method is not uniquely ours. Our method is truly that of liberal religion. I was speaking with a colleague the other day who mistook a Methodist church for a Unitarian Universalist congregation because of the rainbow flag that was decorating its facade. It turns out that our tradition is not the only open-minded, welcoming faith in town, though it may unfortunately rank among the few. There are liberal wings of nearly all religious traditions. To rely on our method as our message is to offer little in the way of distinctiveness or of novelty. Secondly, our method is not enough. The religious life asks for more than good questions. It wants good news. Admittedly, some in our denomination have recently alleged that religious beliefs no longer matter, that method suffices. But I have yet to meet a great pianist without a piano. <laughs> to uniquely structure a faith around method at the expense of message is to stake the success of a restaurant on the dexterity of the chef's hands, as opposed to the quality of his entrees. Both are of utmost importance for sure, but there will undoubtedly come a time when patrons desire more than fast fingers and nimble thumbs. That time, my religious companions, is now. The Reverend Eugene Pickett once stated this truth poignantly and bluntly. The old watchwords of liberalism, freedom, reason, tolerance, worthy though they be, are simply not catching the imagination of the contemporary world. They describe a process for approaching the religious depths, but they testify to no intimate acquaintance with the depths themselves. If we are ever to speak to a new age, we must supplement our seeking with some profound religious findings. 
Over the past month here at First Parish, we have heard firsthand from emissaries of this new age, Unitarian Universalists who grew up in this tradition. And time and again, passionately and with courage, they have pledged their support of this faith. And they have asked for its support of theirs. Most of them, as we saw so poignantly last week, have already mastered the method which attracts so many religious pilgrims to our Unitarian Universalist tabernacle. They know how to access the oracle God places in the breast. They know what it means to practice pluralism, to search for truth in science and religion alike. So why should they stay? What do we have to offer them beyond technique? <clears throat> what will continue to grow them for years to come? I stand here this morning because I believe deep in my heart that Unitarian Universalism does have something to offer our youth. Not merely a method, but some profound religious findings. As a non-creedal faith, we refuse to play pretend and to fool seekers into believing that the vastness of God's goodness can be contained in a single creed handed down supposedly from on high. But neither did Jesus, the harbinger of this historic tradition. Neither did Jesus, who as we just heard, compared the kingdom of God to a single mustard seed. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs. Many religious faiths are content to hand out a shrub full of doctrine, prickling with easy answers. Unitarian Universalism will not. What we do need, though, is a seed, a basic theological message which, when grown, sprouts into the greatest of shrubs. So what is our seed? What is our good news? I do not pretend to have all the answers, but I will not shrink from the challenge of providing the answers I have. I believe that the good news of Unitarian Universalism is this that we are all of one source and destined to one salvation. We are all of one source as our Unitarian forebearers knew, birthed not of some Neoplatonist philosophy, but of one single, generative, creative life force. We call it by many names, but we know that it is one, one dynamic, unity, and that we are one with it. We are all cosmically kin, brothers and sisters, not just in platitude, but in purpose, in our very design, in our very destiny. We share more than we can ever separate. We love and are loved more than we can ever hate or know hatred. All of one source, we are sustained and we are transformed by that holiness which is our origin and our fate. It draws us deep within our very being towards greater goodness. We feel it stir our conscience and pull on our heart strings. And it cradles us in a limitless love, which we may choose to ignore, but from which we can never fully escape. A love that outloves us. A truth that pierces our prejudice. And so, we are also destined to one salvation, much as our Universalist ancestors knew. We are destined to one wholeness, to a life sustained with love. The salvation that we may well experience in this very life, during those fleeting moments that surge with beauty and swell with joy. 
this promise of salvation for us is not founded on coercion or threat, limited to a select few, the chosen ones, but rather available to all, since we who are loved also give our love, opening salvation for one another. The good news of Unitarian Universalism is that every single person shares in this birthright and in this promise of self-fulfillment. To state it most simply, you were given a life of meaning, and you are called to make a meaningful life. This is your religious vocation, but you are not in it alone. We all clear the path together, accompanied by the God within and beyond us, relying on each other for strength and for courage. We are all of one source, destined to one salvation. This simple conviction can make all the difference. To cries of pain, it calls us to sympathy because we are all stitched of that one source. To lashes of injustice, it calls us to outrage, because we are all deserving of that one salvation. To feelings of isolation, it calls us to compassion, because we are all made of one source. And to expressions of joy, it calls us to celebration, because we, we all share in one salvation. What is our good news as Unitarian Universalists? That we are all of one source, destined to one salvation. It is in some ways the smallest of seeds and yet the grandest of visions. Much like Jesus' kingdom, lodged within a single kernel, this simple statement of faith is theologically charged but not overgrown. This good news does not steal away our freedom of belief. Rather, it channels it. And it challenges us to sow this message into the religious truths that we have already found and that we will undoubtedly continue to find in our lives as we search further. This good news does not dictate a specific language of reverence. It does not prescribe an exclusive path to God, but it does provide us with a theological compass with which to navigate the labyrinth of our souls. Above all, this message is anchored in century-old testimony of our religious ancestors. And as such, it testifies now and then to an intimate acquaintance with the depths themselves. Here at First Parish, we know that the method of Unitarian Universalism works. Every single day I am awed by how well you live this method, uh, method building this community with bricks of broad-mindedness and mortar of mutual respect and responsibility. May we never back down from glorifying goodness. May we never back down from trumpeting tolerance. May we never back down from exalting individuality. May we never turn away from fostering freedom. May we never turn away from consecrating questioning. May we never turn away from rejoicing in reason. These are ways of doing religion that are near and dear to us, and for good reason. They represent a method that saves us. But what we need is a message that saves us from ourselves. A message that spans the generations. A message that puts our individualism in the, ser in the service of the whole. A message that calls us to our better selves, that resists our human tendency to appease the status quo. A message that guides us when we are too weak or too nearsighted to guide ourselves. My religious companions, 
let us proclaim with hope and with pride that we are all of one source and destined to one salvation. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. May we offer our children this seed, the seed of a message so powerful that we may someday make our nests in the tree of faith that they have grown. Amen. And blessed be. I love this church. I'm going to let this choir come up. I love this choir. <laughs> and I love... <laughs> I love this church. I love this building. I love most of all the people within this building. I love all of you. And as many of you heard in my sermon that I gave on January 22nd, I will be leaving you to be an intern next year at First Parish in Brookline. And so I've been thinking a lot about how much I appreciate the people and the building and the place that is this church. And I often feel overwhelmed with emotion. Of the six years that I've served this church, I've realized mostly that you all have served me. And one of my goals um, when I began uh, six years ago, I was 29, young and idealistic, inexperienced as a director of religious education, and I wanted, wanted to come and help you to create a community in which your children would want to go to so badly that they would wake you up on Sunday morning, <laughs> bound into your room, wake you up and say, say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to church. Let's go, let's go. We have to go to church. That was my goal for all of you. I wanted to do that with you. I wanted to work with you to create that community. And this morning, I was really tired. <laughs> My family stayed up most of the night last night with a sick baby. Um, and waking up this morning was hard. And my daughter, Cecilia, bounded into my room. And she said, Mommy, Mommy, wake up. We have to go to the torch. <laughs> I can't miss torch. Every day is a torch day. I have to go. And I... <laughs> I teared up. I'm so grateful for this place and for what it has given me and my family. I'm now the mother of two children, both of whom love church. <laughs> we take an on offering every Sunday morning as a part of our worship service for a reason. We all know that we can send our pledge checks into First Parish at any time, at any convenience to support the many ministries that we care about. Ministries that allow my almost five-year-old daughter to bound out of bed on Sunday morning when I'm willing to miss a church day. But we take an offering during the worship service because it is symbolic. We pass the plate during our worship service to make a community expression of thanks for this abundance. This abundance. We take a moment to look around the room. Look around the room right now. Look at the people in this room. Look at the faces. These people make this room sacred. We visibly bring in the harvest at this time, at this most cherished time of the week. Our offering says that the act of giving is as essential to our spiritual well-being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. Our offering is a powerful symbol of gratitude for getting out of bed and coming to church this morning. May it be gratefully given and received. to that place. 